program now deals with what is new in Protobibus. And we will be hearing about the latest trends that Transcribers, that the technology is offering. First speaker up on the stage is Gundram Leifert from Euro University of Rostock, and he will be telling you all the neat and nice details of what Android uh, Text Recognition Plus. Welcome, Gundram. Yeah, I will talk about HR Plus um, behind Transcribers. HR Plus is developed in. Um, at the University of Rostock in the SILAB team, together with uh, Tobias Gruning and then some other guys from our SILAB team. Well, do I want to talk about? I want to talk about uh, some technical parts, probably uh, not that interesting for the most of you. Then um, I will make a comparison between uh, the old and the new HDR. What can you expect from the new HDR? Then I will tell you something about common errors which you can make when you transcribe and train in your network which can make the HDR working worse. Yeah, and then um, I'm ready for a discussion. When you have questions, ask to me. So first of all, what is changed between HDR and HDR Plus? Not much for you. Um, the input is still an image and the output is the transcribed text. The whole thing is trained with connection and temporal classification. This is an algorithm. Yeah, works very, very well. What do we did we change? We changed the software. We um, had an own software, and now we use um, a software uh, based on TensorFlow from Google. We changed the hardware. Um, we do not train on CPUs now. We train on graphical processor units, which are a lot faster. The architecture of the network changed. They became deeper and larger. And also the pre-process we have to change a bit because um, yeah, it has to be faster for the fast networks. Yes, here you can see on the left side the input is always an image. And the output is not only a text, it's also uh, the probability of a character at each position over time from left to right. So this here, black means 100%, white means 0%. This so-called confidence matrix or confmat contains information what is written in the image. So this line here, this is red here, means um, that the 3 is read by the neural network to nearly 100%. Here the network is um, reading the point, here's the space, and so on. So um, the system is more or less working. On the right hand side we see the structure of the HDR. It, is, it has some layers and um, after each layer the presentation of the um, what is saved in the image is changed, more and more abstract. The input is the image and after each of these representation layer, the representation change until to the end we have this confidence matrix. And uh, with the help of this confidence matrix, we can produce a transcription. And we can also use this confidence matrix for the keyword spotting search. So this was the technical stuff. Now, um, what can you expect when you? already had um, a trained model in uh, Transcribos. Here we had a data set, Edelfeld. I, um, I realized there is a typo I, get, I guess, it's, um, it has to be a T. The old HDR is trained on a data set and the result was on the validation set, on the test set, it has 21% character error rate. The new HDR in this case comes down to 9 percent so we can reduce the error by 50%. And the time spent for training was not 20 hours like before, now it's 5 to 6 hours in this case. And in the same time, we can train with 8 times more lines. So um, got, the training got lost fast, but faster. The same for other collections like um, from AVP. We have the same, it is again faster 
and we come down from 19 to 6.35%. For the best thing is um, Conceal's protocol of, um, of Dr. Alvaron, that we come down from 10% at the beginning to 2.6%. So in this case, we nearly enhance the system by 75% character error rate reduction. Yeah, I think the HDR Plus is not available for all of you so far because um, we just have one computer and uh, so many people who want to train. So um, you have to understand that we can open it um, just time after time for everyone. Now to something for you when you make a training, you have to produce training data. We already said uh, the more training data the better, and you already know that. But another big issue is also the quality of the ground truth. Perfect thing would be 100% uh, correct, no errors, but also you make errors, not only the HDR. Uh, when you transcribe with more than one people, um, you have to transcribe them. You have to define some rules how to trans transcribe, how to handle. Um, minus between words, or um, should it be separated by spaces or not? Do you need? Uh, do you have an extra character for hyphenations, or do you use a minus or a equal sign? So, if you transcribe with more people, um, tell them how they have how they have to transcribe. Here's an example: the long s in fracture. Is um, you want to transcribe it as normal s or at long s? Please make one of these versions either the normal s. This is not the problem for the HDR to say the same s at this position and this position. You can also make this, but please do not mix it. The neural network cannot know why it has to recognize long s here and then not long s here when they cannot be. <laughs> so, the ground truth was this year. I, re I found in, in Transcubus this was the ground truth, so... Yeah, but, but you, you see, you need words <laughs> to tell me how to transcribe. Yeah. yeah, so um, this is very crucial, otherwise the network is also confused like me. <laughs> <laughs> the same for um, abbreviations or um, diplomatic text. Often um, the goal you want to have is modernized transcripts, like um, expanded abbreviation um, and so on. Um, this does not work very good. So the network more or less can only read what is on the image. So do not expand abbreviations like conclusion or Wallfahrtsprecher. Just transcribe the short path. When there's just one character between, like um, when you have der, die, das, and the middle character is missing, this is possible. The network can maybe um, transcribe one more character in a word or two more characters, but not, it cannot expand abbreviations. When you produce ground truths, there are in transcribers several steps what go, can go wrong. For example, typical way you transcribe a page, then you apply the HDR to check how good the HDR is working, and then you start a training. Then maybe you start a training with the HDR output. This is, yeah. Not a good idea, because the HDR makes errors. So if you want to train, you have to check that the newest version of the file, which you can find when you click here in the graphical user interface, this window is shown, you have to check that the newest version is not a version produced by an HDR. Otherwise this is used for training. And the best way is to tag pages as ground truths. This is possible um, at the top of the um, graphical user interface. Here you can select from new to the process and um, to ground truth. 
And afterwards, when you start the training, you can check this button, use only ground truth version for training. This checkbox is available on the training um, window. And when you choose this, um, you only take um, these pages where the status is set to ground truth on the page. So you can be sure that no HDR result goes into your training. Only the ground truth pages. Then sometimes the HDR fails. Um, there's one thing you can do. Um, at the top of the graphical user interface, you can show some surrounding polygons. This is a bit complicated to explain. Um, the, the input of the neural network is of the HDR is um, uh, a line surrounded by a with the polygon. This polygon is calculated by algorithm of us, and you do not see them um, in your um, graphical user interface. You have to um, select a check button um, and make it visible. And when you make that, sometimes you see that they make errors, especially at the um, borders of um, of regions at the top or at the bottom. When they um, surround two lines, for example, like here, then the input of the HDR will be two lines. <laughs> the neural network is totally confused and will not um, transcribe anything. So if you see such things, put on the polygons, and this is the reason why your HDR fails. But this is of our to-do list. We will try to improve this polygon method, and hopefully it will be um, no more problem in two or three months. So, questions? Thank you. Can we open up the question now? The microphone is coming. So, thank you very much for your presentation. My question would be, and I'm new to this, will this HDR Plus, is it also like open source? Can it be integrated to other projects than Transcribus? No, it's not open source, um, but there is a REST API that it maybe is um, possible to um, use it without the user, user interface. You can uh, make a request, I guess, um, at a server and say, use this in your network on this page and give me the XML result. And why it is not open source? Because it's funded by public money or not? It is funded by public. And uh, we have the open access things, um, but some of the tools which um, were um, before, which were um, which exist before the project start started, does not have to be made open source. So and it, yes, when when for example someone comes in, yeah, it, it, this is how it is. So if you have something before the project started three years ago, the software or parts, they do not have to be made open source and they are still used in these things. Further questions? Hi, uh, uh, a simple technical question. Uh, will it be uh, possible in future to, uh, to launch two model in the same page because we have sometimes a page with uh, two and writing text different from two hands different. And uh, I guess if, uh, if it's possible to have two model for the same page or a combined model. So in theory we have some um, transcribers interfaces uh, for HDR. And there, for example, um, Transcribus supports regions. And um, you can have different regions, and then you can say, use this model for this region, and this model for the other region. This is, um, this is, is possible um, in the interfaces, but it's not so far um, usable via um, Transcribus user interface. So it's true, it, it is already possible. But um, the user interface is not so far. Yeah. 
one comment from my side concerning the usability of HDR Plus. Uh, as you have seen, we have a new um, release uh, came out uh, this week or last week, and with the new release, you can already use HDR Plus models if they are there and if they are uh, opened up to everyone. Uh, the training uh, of the HDR Plus model is uh, working as well, but here we have really have the problem that if everyone now is interested to press the button, uh, our servers will crash. It's just one server, it is a powerful GPU server, but uh, just eight uh, jobs can be done at once. So um, it takes a while. And therefore, we came up with the idea actually that we will uh, retrain all models which are there in an automated way. So uh, this means that uh, we will start with the latest ones and more updated models will appear uh, simply in, in your collection. And uh, in that way, we, we hope that it can be done, uh, will utilize the, the server in the best way because always eight jobs were running and, and we care about this uh, automatically. So that's the way uh, we decided to, to do it. And, and then, if when the first spy for me uh, <laughs> is over, then uh, we will open up the HDR Plus uh, training, of course, also to you. Thank you. I have a question about the abbreviation because you said that the, the, the abbreviations doesn't work. I mean, it cannot read the abbreviation, but yesterday I heard from from Ginter, I think, that it, it does. So I am confused. <laughs> Uh, I, mean, I would like to, to I mean, because I don't know exactly how the computer read the text, so uh, I am curious uh, how it is finally. I mean, is it worth to write abbreviation if they are easy, let's say, or totally not, only the, the letters which we can see? Because, for example, let's say that we have some abbreviation which is always the same three letters with the, with the line up and it is somewhere, no? Uh, and uh, so we should write, for example, that in medieval Christus is X per H, never mind, but and is it, is it uh, worth to write it like, uh, like it should be, or just these three letters? So, when there's just one letter missing, or you expand one or two letters to two or three, that's fine. But um, assuming our algorithm works like that, he can say every of the slots here, he can say one character. So assuming you are training with 3rd January, where should he read the last five characters here in this, this part here? There's no, no space to read characters. But when you just want to have one more character, the system can put it in here somewhere in the slots. Like, yeah, when you have some it's the same for both. It is it's the same problem for both. So when you have just one character or so, that's that's fine. This is what Goethe mean. But when you have DR for doctor or other longer expansions, then um, the network will fail. It will try and it will probably match two or three characters, but not the whole. And the character error rate will be there. <laughs> Will it be possible in future that I make some rules in the transcription? For example, I have a, a XPS for crystals, and then I say to the training program, to the training software, every time you still reading XPS and the transcription is XPS, please um, um, yeah, make the uh, write it like crystals in it. That every user makes a rule for uh, uh, own rule for it. For example. Yes. Yeah. These things are a lot of work because you have to upload the dictionary, and which has a kind of um, standard, and then you can apply them. Yes. I'm not sure if this is um, how how high is it on the priority list. It's really possible. Yes. Same as abbreviation. Yeah. Yeah. Or as named entities, it's the same. Yeah. Okay, let's thank Gondram again. Next up in 
this uh, really interesting session is uh, our read colleague Hervé Dijon from Navalabs in Grenoble, and he will be telling you about tables and about document understanding. Thank you. So this is a common work with uh, Etva and Fran from CBL and two colleagues from Navalabs. And so the so just to give you an anecdote. So the first time I saw a similar image from it on. Um, my reaction was not so enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> and I was really wondering if we can do something for such image. Uh, well, two years later, I would say we have some hope. Okay. <laughs> so uh, here, what I'm going to talk about. So first, I would like to define what, what, is, what I understand as table understanding, just to make sure you are on the same page. And when I, then I will go through several scenarios, uh, which are strictly the way the table processing uh, part of the RIC project uh, has evolved. And then I will go quickly through a couple of examples to, to show you what we can do. And then I will discuss an initiative we are going to have basically to build uh, open source data sets for uh, handwritten tables that we can uh, share with the academic community and so that everyone is able to tackle the, the task and uh, share their results and then quick skips for next year. So here this is a typical table we have from the Passal collection and so by basically table understanding, what I understand is basically the recognition of the row structure and the column structure of the table. So the first task is to spot the table and then to recognize the rows and the columns to get the cells. You can have extra information such as the column headers or row headers and here uh, textual elements outside the table. And uh, so that, then, uh, you can automatically uh, access the row uh, structure of the table or the column structure of the table, depending on, on your data. So this is what I'm going to talk and how we do this. So this how we do this, so scenario zero, or I would say even minus one. <laughs> Basically, suppose you have just one page with one table, so what you can do now is to use the expert user interface where you can manually design the table yourself. And then we'll be able to export uh, this table into uh, an Excel spreadsheet if you want. So this is currently valuable. How to do this? There is an how to uh, written by EFA uh, that you can download. The second scenario is basically you you don't have just one page, but you have a book. But it's a kind of uh, printed book where for each page you have exactly the same table, which is fairly common in the archives. Here, the solution designed by Florian in the room. But basically, so we ask the user to draw the first page of the document, and then the tool will be able to match this template against the remaining pages of the book. And then you will get the book fully structured in terms of this. Here, what you will get with this tool is the column structure of the tables. Because the template in terms of columns is similar from page to page, but not often not in terms of rows. So uh, it's currently available not through the user the graphical user API, but through the programmatic one, so the REST API. So, if, uh, so you need to be a bit familiar with uh, this API if you want to use it. Or if you want, you can also download the tool and apply the tool uh, on your uh, images. So it's ex also explained in the same how to guide uh, about the table. So the next scenario is you don't have just one book, but you have hundreds of books, and each book will have a 
uh, a different template. So you don't want to take to open each book, book the table for the first page and then process it. So the purpose here is to automate this. And uh, the tool we're currently developing is basically a tool which takes a book, kind of mine the set of pages in order to automatically generate column structure on the table and then apply the previous template matching tool on these tables so you can get the column structure for each page and so you can do it automatically for a large number of books. A quick example here, from the same book you have three different pages, the same table and basically the tool is able to recognize the vertical organization of the, of the tables. So from this vertical organization, what is missing is the horizontal one, so the, the rows one. For this, we use basically input. So we recognize the text line of the table. So if you apply the layout to integrate in the previous, you get automatically this. As mentioned several times, but it's worth mentioning again how the tool developed by Tobias is really, really good. I've been working with this for more than a year and I'm still trying to find a page, page will, which will change it. So, from this uh, set of text lines, what we can do is to categorize each text line with meaningful information. For instance, here the tool is able to recognize elements uh, outside the table and also the column headers automatically. And uh, if you want really the row structure, the idea we had was basically to try to automatically recognize a text line which are in yellow and thank you. And which basically start those text lines in yellow basically correspond to the first text line in the given cell, so in the row. And with this information, we are basically able to generate this kind of output. So here we have the full table structure with the columns, the rows, so from this we generate the cell structure, the headers are computed, and elements uh, outside the table are uh, also recognized. So this kind of outputs is currently possible if you know the table for the given book. Uh, so sorry, the the template. So in here, yeah, the template was provided. So the, the template finding the column for the, the table was provided manually, and then the row uh, recognition was automatically done. Depending on the tables you have, you can also try various other possibilities. So here, the graphical lines in the page were recognized. And the idea is basically that from this information, you should also be able to rebuild the table structure automatically. The issue is that sometimes you don't have any graphical information in the table, so you cannot only relies on graphical information. You have to combine uh, both, so the, the textual information and the graphical one. This is exactly what we are trying to do to merge all this type of information together. Uh, so all the methods we are using are based on machine learning. So for this, uh, for the HTR, you need to provide the system with samples. And annotated tables. And uh, so we have such a data set for PASAO, for uh, NAF as well. And in here we are building a more generic data set around table. So we did ask you a couple of months ago to provide us with tables. So we have around 25 different providers. So now the data set is composed of roughly 1,500 images from very various tables, uh, mostly handwritten. We have also some printed tables as well. And uh, so we annotate 
the, the tables. So first we had to write the guidelines. Uh, it was not always easy when you see a table to know how you would like it to be structured. Sometimes you have different tables in one image that are uh, very similar. You know if you want one table or two, it really depends. And so the data set will be released uh, for the competition next year. And the one question is basically, can we, with this kind of data, generate kind of generic uh, model for table, which is uh, as good as the text line detection we we had in the in the project. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, I guess one backup solution is for a given solution, uh, given uh, collection to annotate samples of the collection and just to train the stem on this specific uh, collection. Uh, so we'll. I don't know if. So because that, yeah, I don't know if we will be able to uh, have a kind of generic model for uh, table processing. We'll see next year. So. Yeah, next year. So, a schedule is a bit fuzzy, but uh, this is the best I can do. So, the, what we want to do is to release the first prototype for table processing, I would say, by the end of the year. So, it will be available first as a standalone tool. It's written in Python, so you will have to download it and to, to run it on your, on your collection. And I get the plan is to integrate this into the transcript server uh, next year. So we'll see. And uh, so Victor is a, the main conference in the domain of document uh, analysis and recognition. It will be next year in September. And for this conference, we will organize a uh, table recognition uh, competition <coughs> with a data set, which should be available beginning of next year, I guess. So if you're more interested in this work, we published with a fan for uh, a paper on the last uh, task workshop uh, this year about the work done for the Passau collection. Uh, we try to describe as much as I can in the label we need to write for the read project by the end of, the, of this year. Uh, if you're interested, the current version of the software is available through GitHub. Uh, don't try to use it currently. Wait a couple of weeks at least. Uh, and uh, we have already some data which was used for the article and from the Pathal collection. And uh, those data set is publicly available on Zenodo. So I don't remember the size of the data set. 200 to 300 pages of the Pascal table is completely uh, annotated. And uh, if you have questions. Thank you, Abby. Questions on tables. Shoot them out now or never. This is your chance. Don't you have to tell the system which way to read it? Do you read it from top to bottom or do you read it from left to right? Don't you have to sort of add this before you send or transcribe your documents? Okay, sorry, I don't know the question. Well, I mean, if you have a table, yeah. you can read it from top to bottom or you can read it from left to right. The structure of the, of the, the, the table will be a two-dimensional structure, so basically, at the end of the process, you're able to, to do both. Okay. It's like uh, in Excel, I mean, you will be able to navigate column-wise or row-wise. That's the purpose of the task. And then it depends on the data you have in the table. Sometimes there's the, the row reading that makes sense. Sometimes it's the column reading. It depends on the task. So it's through that here. It's, this is not the end of the process. Once you have the table, then if you want to basically feed a database with the information in the table, 
you have still to do some information extraction process and normalization and a couple of things. But <coughs> at least you have this two-dimensional structure and you can use it. Thank you. Could you say something a bit more about the, the content? So the content of tables often will be maybe nominal data or dates? Uh, so, yeah, here. So this is what we we have done for Passau. Uh, here you, it will be true in your case as well, you need basically to know, for instance, uh, that in a given column you will find specific information. Uh, and then you have to design an information extraction tool usually dedicated to your task in order to extract the information automatically. Here we I don't think that the generic tool, I mean, you can have a generic tool to recognize dates or names, but uh, if you have just one name in the, one sort of column with a date, then you can put some semantic, you know, it's a birth date and it's, it's fine for you. Uh, and that's how we, we, in the re, in that recourse, you have the date, date but also the burial date. We have to know which one will be the the burial and the and the death. And for names as well, you in the marriage readings you will have the, adding if you add the the witness as well, you can have for a given wedding you can have four or five names. And then you have to find out the bride and so it really is across one. So, yeah, information extraction currently is not that generic. So, uh, thank you very much for an interesting uh, presentation. Your module, will that be able to, will, we, will it be able to use your model of the one you've been developing for, say, like uh, OCR uh, programs as well? I mean, we have lots of tables that are printed text in it. Yeah, is for us, it doesn't matter if it's in written or I would be interested to hear what uh, you are saying about how far you should array a generic uh, definition. Uh, well. Actually, you got the point quite right in the first talk you give, uh, it depends on the data. And actually, I think uh, the, the success of the, of the, of the current um, layout analysis is, is based on the efforts of the uh, Vienna team collecting the read that data set, which seems to be very, very representative that uh, you are hardly find any document stress it really hard. And with the data set you are already you are collecting right now, actually that, that's a really important step to yeah, improve the baseline detection for this uh, this table, yeah, for the table scenario. And to cluster these for the entire, to get the entire, the complete um, structure of the table, I think it's not so far away. So basically, if you got all the baselines correct, then I think you don't have so much problems to get the, the, the root lines, right? Or your tool, tool is working quite well right now. Sometimes you don't have, what do you mean by root lines? Um, the horizontal. A boundary between the um, rows. Uh, you have a couple of parameters depending. And when you see the different kind of tables you can have in the data set, mm -hmm. uh, you are not so at that point currently. And, uh, well, we'll see. It's always hard, hard to say. I would guess it's within the next year. Based on the on the data set, if it's so representative and if you can work with it, maybe. I don't find the world representative because the feature archive is and um, you go to the next archive and you will see documents but you don't have in the data set. Uh -huh. Yeah, and therefore it's therefore it's it's cool, it's necessary that these algorithms as well are trainable and are adaptable to the needs of the users and the different yeah, archives and libraries. In order to, to avoid this uh, annotated data problem, what we're framing now is to use synthetic data. 
basically we are able to automatically generate tables which are annotated and then we can train the system with this synthetic data and so if you know some of the type of tables you have to process you, you can generate uh, tables which are very similar and then the first results are fairly encouraging so you just have to uh, give some parameters to the generator and then this is the way you can generate uh, data here so we'll see if it's robust enough well, thank you very much, Abby. Um, uh, I think there's a lot more things coming up on tables and on HDR. So uh, let's give Abby a hand. <laughs> I have the great pleasure to welcome to the stage our head marketing person for keyboard spotting. <laughs> Um, Gunther Müllberger will also be speaking about sharing HDR models and about the new fancy interface, the transcriber stack. Okay, so uh, this was a good introduction uh, that I'm marketing uh, keyword spotting and you will hear more about keyword spotting tomorrow morning and also see um, the nice uh, implementation of uh, keyword spotting application at the, uh, for the Bantam project. So. Um, and probably this is the best marketing you can think about it. But uh, actually, I'm now telling the story about keyword spotting since a year or more. And interestingly, the reaction of the audience is often no oh, interesting, but then it stops actually. And uh, so I thought I give you a quick one more try and also show you what what is integrated already in Transcribus. And then I would like to talk quickly about with you what to do with the many HDR models we have now in Transcribus and how to enable sharing and also give a quick uh, outlook to Transcribus uh, web interface we saw it yesterday already uh, and I think you will also experience it in the workshop so uh, I will be very brief, I promise. Yeah, keyword spotting. Usually searching is performed via a good transcription. But for large collections, also with HDR+, Plus, you will have the situation that you need a lot of training data that you can process millions of pages and uh, if there are hands you've never seen by the engine, the recognition rate will be not as good that the usual full text search will produce uh, good results. So that's a matter of fact, I would say. And in many cases, you will not have the resources to transcribe thousands of pages, and uh, also a case where the recognition rate for unseen hands uh, will not be so good. And here comes um, the idea of keyword spotting. Is it possible to search not in the transcription but directly in the image? And this is the main idea. There are several approaches actually. Um, it sounds a bit like magic, how can I find a word uh, which is not actually recognized by the engine uh, and therefore I, I uh, created a little uh, presentation which uh, tries to uh, visualize this a little bit and let's assume we have dogs, cats and birds and we want to train a neural network recognizing these nice animals so we would label some images that there's a dog on this image and a cat on this image and a bird on the third image. Uh, we expect that the neural network learns and outputs this uh, in a correct way. So that would be, I guess, a typical student work at the university in your course. And other applications, of course, recognizing images which have not been seen by the computer, by the neural networking beforehand. So the question is, what is on this image? And this magic box is working and produces, as we have heard, a confidence rate. And in that case, it says uh, something between null and one, 0 0.6. And uh, let's assume it uh, says this is a cat. So this is the correct answer. 
This is something in between the dog <laughs> and the cat. I was very happy when I found it. <laughs> so uh, let's see. <laughs> it's not a bird, uh, maybe a cat, and uh, with the confidence of over six, it's a dog. So the highest confidence level is the cat, but the correct answer is the dog. Okay, so if we transform this to the transcription searching issue, the transcription is incorrect. Uh, because the system would say my highest uh, value is cat, and that's incorrect. But if you are now searching, you will say give me all images which are above a certain threshold. And it would return this image as a dog. So if you are searching for dogs, it would correctly uh, give you this image because it's about a certain question. That's the main idea, I think, of keyword spotting. And uh, the transcription still would be wrong, but uh, in your search results, it would appear on a relatively high rank. That's the main idea. And this uh, technology is now using the alphabet. So cat, dogs, birds are the single characters your text or recognized text. And uh, the transcription are the characters with the highest confidence, but keywords searching provides you the stream which is above a given confidence. That's again the magic of this technology which makes it so powerful and is not based on the text. It is based on the kind of indexing of the image. In Transcribers we have now uh, implemented this in two ways actually. One comes uh, from Rostock, uh, from the Citra group, one comes from Spain, Alejandro and, and colleagues. One uses the confidence matrix, so this, what you have seen before, this character-based uh, confidences, <coughs> or both are using this in a different way, actually. So, let me say, implemented keyword spotting in, in Transcribus, you can directly search after you have performed the recognition. This means that, which is a very nice thing, because you just run the recognition and you can immediately search uh, afterwards. The, the, the way it is done is that uh, each confidence matrix is opened and uh, with, uh, I think, um, dynamic programming, uh, the, the, the best uh, matching strings and so on um, are found. Um, this is fast, but for large collection, collections, it is probably not really fast, or it requires a strong computing power behind. The other way comes from the team in Valencia, and here a lot of work goes in creating an index. So the index is a reduced confidence matrix uh, based on some highly sophisticated processing. Um, Former times uh, they used words, now they are using engrams as far as understood. Therefore, the auto vocabulary problem, which is always appears with indexes, can be avoided. And uh, the good thing is we have really quick response time and we can use standard uh, full text engines for implementing this index. Yeah, it looks like uh, the same as uh, the interface is more or less always the same. Um, it is uh, not a final interface, it's really more of a demo. This is maybe also one of the reasons why we are not working that much with keyword spotting. I, I see the keyword spotting requests in the user statistics and they are always very low. So uh, it's also one of the reasons why I wanted to mention this here as well. In this upcoming project with the National Archive for Finland, we will implement keyword spotting and we will thinking goes in a direction that uh, how to use this kind and how to uh, uh, design the user interface and currently we believe that it will look similar to what I uh, show you here. So you on the one hand you have uh, the, the tree level which is from my point of view very important for archives because in archives Documents are typically ordered in a hierarchical way. So users which are searching for a word uh, will get an answer how 
many hits are on a specific hierarchical level, starting with level one, and then uh, you come to the collection, to the sub collection, sub sub collection, and so on. But then, okay, you can likely order the snippets or the hits in the usual way. And uh, on the right hand side, we would have some facets, so to narrow the search according to the um, document, so the archival unit, or to places appearing on the same page, or to keywords appearing on the same page as, as you were looking for. And in the center of the interface, uh, I would imagine an image snippet which shows two or three lines so that we get a kind of context and you can uh, already have a first uh, look at the, the hit, uh, at the result, and decide, and I think this is very important, decide if this is relevant for you or not. Because this is something I'm currently missing very much with all kinds of uh, user interfaces in the archival and, and library world, that you stop the searching and that it's very seldom possible to export and to take the data with you. And uh, that's I think is really important. So um, one other idea is, but this is really just the first idea, is that if you have maybe already decided that this is interesting for you, you might uh, even add a, a command or a tag for this snippet or even start to correct this or that line because you know that's relevant for me and then afterwards uh, save it and uh, also export it either in GE as an extra document with transcribus because you want to work on these pages or to uh, extra or PDF or whatever so that, that you can take something with you. So that's um, our really thinking. We'll see what we will really realize. Uh, Leopold is smiling because uh, <laughs> he knows that this will be on his table. <laughs> um, I skip the demo and come to the sharing HDR models. Yes, um, I think you have seen that there are really a lot of models now available, but the only ones who can see this are us, and that's not a very satisfying situation. So I know that many of you want to share your models, uh, and, and that really makes sense, and it also would, of course, lead to the situation that more people are working together, not single users in transcribus, but that you are working together and that you get the feeling, oh wow, someone trained a great Latin model for medieval stuff, and I am benefiting of that. And that, that of course, makes the group much more uh, a group and, and uh, is, is, I think, really great. So um, I'm happy that we are now in this situation that we can think about that. And uh, the question is, of course, how to, how to make it. So I'll share here some ideas on this. I think we will need some metadata. So the language does not play directly a role for the HDR. But on the other hand, since the neural networks learn the context, the uh, distribution of characters will have an influence, so language will be uh, an idea. Then uh, the time of writing is actually very hard often to say um, because it's just fussy medieval stuff or late 18th century. Yeah, but um, on the other hand, we have heard today that people are training models for early writing, later writing, and so on. So. And the script, I mean, definitely printed and handwriting is something which makes uh, sense, but also specific writing styles, maybe from the Middle Ages, maybe uh, in German, Corinth or Sutherland, um, sim similar styles probably would exist in other languages as well. What is very helpful, I think, is the description of the document used for training. That's because the experts know what is specific with their document, other experts will understand exactly this uh, thing. So, a, a short narrative, of one or two lines, I think, uh, will always be helpful. But I think to have an example of the pages is, of course, the easiest way to share the knowledge on models or to, to 
attract other users to use them. But here we have to see that, or we foresee that, uh, of course, some of you will be happy to share test data. So if you have a test set and you just say, okay, I'll share it to everyone, then it's fine. Uh, and we can show uh, all the data to everyone. But uh, others will say, well, I, I, I got the images from a library, I'm not sure uh, what is the legal situation. So I, I cannot say just uh, I share it to everyone, which means more or less like a publication or a distribution. So we came up with the idea maybe of sharing just a few lines, which is likely enough. So this you know this interface now and uh, here it would have more or less just a button that says share this model with the Dunskinus community. And uh, the idea with the lines could be that uh, some random lines are selected from, from the document and uh, if, if these lines do not contain any um, names or anything what you say uh, is uh, somehow um, uh, could uh, provide uh, complications, uh, you could select some, some lines and, and the user would see at least some lines and get an idea of the right style of this model. Under consideration is also that we, but this is really a brute force model, way that you just need to transcribe some lines and, and specify maybe the period of the language and then uh, that there is a button to, to run this uh, against all available public models and so that you get, uh, based on the count tools of several lines, uh, the best model available for your uh, specific document. That um, I think can also be done with um, with uh, uh, those data. So these uh, are some some ideas on how we could uh, do it. And uh, soon, every one of you will have the chance to uh, have a look to his own document via the Mind Collections website. So this means that you see all your documents on the web as well. And that's then uh, you can select the document and the document pages. And here are the two main modes, uh, the plain text mode, which means it's mostly mainly for transcription. And it really allows you to concentrate on the transcription uh, and you have in principle the same options as with the Transcribus Expert Client that you can add special character, characters that you can superscript, uh, underline, bold, and so on. But you also can, and this is also configurable or will be configurable, that, um, that uh, users uh, can use uh, annotation, uh, an extended version of this um, tool, and this means that the annotation can also be done in here, including the properties, so the attributes for the tags. And that's currently more or less all, but uh, we believe that uh, with this, um, you will be able to involve people who are not so much familiar or who do not want to get familiar with the Transcribus Expert Client but, with, with the, uh, but want to contribute in transcribing. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Günther. Uh, it's the nerve of uh, everyone in the crowd, so let me just uh, get a quick show of hands for open questions. Let's start here in front. Just a little question. Gunther, do you think that it might be possible that annotations are also part of the um, uh, training? That the machine itself in, in the future will recognize names, etc.? So this problem is well known as name entity recognition, and uh, it depends on training data. So <laughs> we, we have we have we need, of uh, tech. Yeah, we That's need something. really need good training data for name entity recognition for tagging, and then we can um, maybe provide 
somewhere and something. I know that um, the company he's working for us. Yeah. Actually, it's right now quite high at our priority list. So we would be happy about some more. We have some some data sets, some academic stuff, but if there are a few more from the historical yeah, problems, mm -hmm. then we are yeah. We think we can provide something within the next half year. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Again, Gunter okay. will be here as well as the other speakers.